I can barely believe my ears. It's another episode of Startups for the Rest of Us. Welcome to this week's episode. It's episode 501. Today, I talk with Mike Tabor of Blue Tick to get his update that I get every month or two. It's good to connect with Mike. Last time we spoke, it was the beginning of the COVID quarantine process. And so it was uh, good to catch up with him today. Before we dive into that, through helpfounders.com, I have volunteered up a couple ad slots for startup founders. And specifically, I had an ad a few episodes back. And every so often, I will be talking about someone in our community in this startup to the rest of us, MicroConf, Bootstrapper, self-funded, indie-funded founder community. And this week, the company I want to talk about is called Versoli, V-E-R-S-O-L-Y.com. Versoli is a SaaS-focused landing page and website builder aimed, of course, at SaaS marketers and founders. I had the pleasure of speaking with the founder through an impromptu meeting on MicroConf Connect. And MicroConf Connect, if you don't know, is our, I think it's about 1,100 founders and aspiring founders in a Slack community that are helping each other out, sharing info, asking questions. And we did a MicroConf meet away where we were paired up with individuals and just got to have a conversation for five or 10 minutes. And then it kind of rolled, spun the roulette wheel and connected you with the next person. And it was uh, it was super fun to be able to meet other like-minded people that I otherwise just wouldn't have connected with. I wouldn't jump on Zoom or, you know, otherwise uh, wind up in Squadcast talking to them. So I had the pleasure of meeting the founder of Versoli.com. And Versoli solves that problem of, well, I, I need this marketing site. I don't want to build it in my app so that I have to do a code push to change it. I don't really want to do it in WordPress. Should I do it in Squarespace? Do I do a static site builder? And, and Versoli's goal is to get you past that. Their headline is conversion-focused website builder. Versoli is a single platform to build landing pages, create blog posts, and collect leads. No code required. So check them out if you are in the market for that and help out some fellow bootstrap founders. I've been getting great feedback about recent episodes, lots of, of praise, but also some constructive feedback. And it's it's super helpful for me to hear what you're what you're thinking about the episodes. I've been changing up formats, experimenting, and I received a really nice email from a listener. And he said, best episode ever as the subject line. He said, I thought you'd like to know that the two-part episode this week, which was episode 499 and 499 and a half that I recorded with Jordan Gall about the first six stages of SaaS growth, he said, was beyond words stunning. I don't know if people at the start of the journey will appreciate it quite as much, but speaking from a business in the product market fit stage, this was utterly compelling. Two things made it so extraordinary. The similarities and differences of your two experiences, which played in my head the similarities differences with my own. And number two, the way you two built up a picture so similar to the experience I've lived and then explained what's about to happen next, which played in my head as news that I need to know and be aware of. Thank you, and please pass on my thanks to Jordan as well. This is very informative and inspirational. And thank you, thank you so much for writing that email. This was helpful in a couple ways because, yeah, of course, it makes me feel good and it makes me feel like I'm, I'm, you know, on to something with it. But he specifically called out how this was helpful to him and how I'm able to, you know, now in the future think of how I can shape other episodes to have, you know, perhaps a similar focus or similar format. Because there was some unique experimentation with that episode with Jordan. It wasn't an interview, but it. It, it was two people sharing their parallel experiences and kind of comparing and contrasting. And so I'm glad that it resonated. I know we had a great time recording it and could, that's why it went on so long because I felt like it was just so packed densely with, with information that I'm hoping can you know help startup founders like yourself. So keep an eye out for potentially more episodes like that in the future. And with that, let's chat with Mike Tabor, the co-host emeritus of Startups for the Rest of Us, who co-hosted the show with me for the first 448 episodes and now comes back every month or two to give us updates on his progress with his startup, bluetick.io. Mr. Mike, hashtag Tabor, how are you doing this week? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing all right, man. It's always, uh, it's always good to chat with you. Catch up, hear how things have been going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. What's the news? I mean, 500th episode went live last week, man. How does how does it yep. feel to be as old, to be the old the old guy at the club? You ever heard that Chris <laughs> Rock thing? You're not that old. You're just a little too old to be at the club. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's I don't know. It's it's been a long ride. <laughs> yeah, it's a trip. More a little more than a decade. 500 episodes. Although when I I log into Castos and um, it looks like there's actually f like 523 audio files because we've done half episodes, we've done bonus episodes, we've done announcement episodes, you know, there's yep. this, but you know, the numbering is, it's what's important, I think. 
Yeah, I mentioned to my wife that on the website there was episode 499.5, and she's like, what is that? (laughs) (laughs) So here's what happened, actually. I went to record this episode with Jordan Gall, and it was just a really good conversation, and I didn't want to cut it off, but it was over an hour. We recorded for an hour and 15 minutes, and so I was like, no problem. I will just cut this in half and air one this week and one next week. Of course, I had already had a bunch of stuff planned for episode 500, which was the next week, and it's like, ah, so I need, I want to do this as a two-parter. I'm going to do it like a Tuesday, Thursday type thing. That's that's what happened, and you know, maybe in retrospect, I should have just left it as an hour and 10-minute episode. It, it worked out fine. It's fine. I think that just having those half episodes every once in a while, it's like, oh, here's a sort of like little bonus or something like that. That's that's totally fine. Plus, it lets people kind of split it up in their podcast player a little bit. It's like, oh, what's that? Right. It's like, hey, a 30 minute episode's kind of cool. And I, I agree, like hearing anytime I have a podcast that I like a lot and they unexpectedly release another episode, I'm stoked because I'm like, oh, two episodes this week. I get twice the fun. And so that's that's a little bit what I was going for at that. 499.5. <laughs> oh, <that's funny. laughs> so what do you what do you think, man? So in the five hundredth episode, I know that you're not on Twitter, you're not listening to the podcast anymore, but I talked a little bit about why I think the podcast has been successful and stuck around this long and all that. And I mean, one reason it stuck around is because we just kept showing up, you know. But I talked about consistency and just being authentic. Like we we were always kind of ourselves on the show rather than trying to play up parts or or be dramatic or play a role. But those were the two things that came to mind for me. There's obviously, as I listened back to 500, I was like, oh, there's at least another two that I think I could name now. But I'm curious if you've, you know, if you've given it any thought, like why the podcast has been successful. Why did it stick around for so long? Way to put me on the spot without putting anything in the outline. <laughs> I totally should have given you a heads up. You That's have time right. though, because you can edit out the silence, right? No, I can't. <laughs> It'll get edited out. I'm sure it would. No, I mean, I I agree with you definitely on those two points. I think that the consistency of showing up every single week and being able to have people count on it and reliably know that that podcast episode was going to go live on every Tuesday. And I can only remember one instance where it didn't go live on Tuesday morning when people expected it to. And it was because of some snafu in WordPress where it just didn't get published for some reason. Everything was ready. It just didn't go out at the time that we expected it to. So it went out like three or four hours later. But I mean, by seven, eight o'clock in the morning, we were already getting emails like, hey, are you going to put a podcast out this week? Because I'm not seeing it in my player. So I think that the I don't want to call it demand for it, but the anticipation of knowing that it's going to be there every Tuesday for some people is just like it's part of their ritual. It's part of their their weekly commute or something along those lines, maybe their daily run. They're like, oh, it's Tuesday. I get to go listen to this. So I do think that that plays a major part in it. And then I also agree with you that the fact that we're ourselves on the podcast is probably has a lot to do with it because we've met people in person at MicroConf or different other, other conferences or in-person meetups and stuff like that. And I hear from people on occasion, they're like, yeah, you're really not any different than you sound like on your podcast. And I never really understood that before until like my kids have started watching YouTube and they watch some of these shows where these people are just, they act like completely off the wall. Like they're obviously like late twenties, thirties. Some of them are probably even older than that. And they act like they're 12 and it's just, they make these ridiculous comments and it's aimed at a younger audience, which I guess, you know, with YouTube, you're not really not supposed to do that, but I, I can almost guarantee that that's not how those people act in real life. So it's like, it's an act, it's a show for them. But we're just really having a conversation. So I think that that definitely plays into what has been appealing to people. I mean, also being one of the first podcasts aimed at bootstrappers probably didn't hurt. And the one that people recommend quite a bit. So we're actually out there doing this stuff and not just talking about it, but doing it as well. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting point because I have often thought when we launched in 2010, the other, like the radio that I listened to was pretty heavily produced. I would listen to like morning shows and those DJs are totally doing the performance thing, right? With the horn, Sunday, 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 you know, and their voice is just, it's like, whoa. But, you know, some people have come on the scene who do have these big personalities and like, you know, I think of like a Gary V where like when he actually sits down, he's pretty chill, but definitely on his video blog, like he played it up big time when he was, you know, doing the wine tasting. 
but it worked for him. And so that's the thing is I, I wouldn't say, oh, you, you should just be authentic because we did and, and it's worked for us. I honestly wonder if perhaps it's to our detriment because you and I are kind of chill, even keeled people. And maybe if we had played it up and had a bunch of drama, we'd like have, would we have twice the audience? So, you know, maybe it's a, a, a counterfactor and just, just the fact that we've been around 10 years has been the reason for success. Shut up, Rob. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Yeah, like, let's start. We've like never had arguments on the air except for about desktop versus laptop, Mac versus Windows. But this will be it. This will be the argument. <laughs> we'll just go back to an arm wrestling match. I mean, I, you know, it's funny that I, I bring that up almost facetiously, but like most of the audience probably doesn't know this. But the um, first microconf that we ran, the last question I put on the 45, 50 plus question survey was who would win in an arm wrestling match, Mike or Rob? And 75% of the audience said me. So I think we should revisit that and put oh, that on man. another survey. Those poor suckers. <laughs> we should. And we should make it a little interesting. How about we put a little green down on this, uh, <laughs> on this thing? <laughs> then we're actually going to have to have the, the arm wrestling match at some point, though. We'll do the match. And, and once I know when it's scheduled for, I'm going to start just all the time when I'm on phone calls, I'm just going to be doing curls with my right arm, <laughs> just <laughs> pumping and just pumping him and a huge bicep on the arm. Well, man, it's, it's cool to have uh, made it to 500 and I'm glad you're able to join us again this week to kind of catch us up on, on what you've been up to over the past seven weeks. It's been seven weeks since our chat, episode 494. Frankly, the, the two calls prior to that, our two conversations were positive. You were upbeat. You were motivated. Things were working. You had more than doubled in about four or five months. And then last time we talked was right, it was in late April. It was right at the beginning or kind of as a couple of weeks into the whole COVID quarantine stuff. And you basically said that, that current trajectory of growth had not continued. You had plateaued. And I felt like both of us were kind of like, yeah, a lot of apps are doing that right now. There's so much uncertainty. Now, since then, with uh, companies that I'm working with and have insight into, stuff has started picking up again, at least to some extent. There are still those those big winners, you know, that are, let's say, Zoom, you know, or Slack or someone in the podcast space, you know. And then there's there's big losers that are you know, software for, for schools that are all shut down or, you know, whatever we can, we think of those examples, but kind of the people in the middle that like 70 ish percent, at least based on the numbers I'm seeing have seen a, like an, an uptick in interest and people are marketing again and people are sending deals again. So I'm curious to hear from your perspective, bluetick.io, is it following that trajectory as well over the past couple months? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it, it definitely dipped a little bit after our last conversation, probably, what, seven weeks ago or something like that. So it dipped for probably another three or four weeks after that. And that was in terms of like existing customers kind of churning out and saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to put my subscription on hold for a little while and then revisit this in a couple months. And since then, things have started to tick back up again. And last week, I actually had a customer who was already on board, and they upgraded to the tune of another $500 a month or so. So that's good to see. You know, obviously, like the tool itself is doing what it's supposed to do, and you know, it's it's working for them. So they've expanded the use of it by quite a bit. It, it's nice to see that. And there's, I think there were other two other deals that. I had been working on one of them. They had that conversation internally about whether or not they were going to look into blue tick and, and use it to replace the existing tool. And they said, look, we've made this decision internally that we're not going to start any new vendor relationships right now, but we do want to revisit this. They just basically said not right now. And then there's the other one that I was working on where that one's sort of in limbo right now, still working on trying to figure out exactly what's going on there, but it's not, I haven't been told no, but I haven't been told yes either. One was a pilot and another was a lar just a large customer in the funnel, right? Did the pilot not go through? Yeah, it was the pilot that they said, we want to come back and revisit this because they didn't have the time to actually dedicate to doing the pilot. They did some things here and there, but they really didn't spend a lot of time on it. And I talked to them a couple of times about it during the pilot. And they said, yeah, we're just really busy. We're swamped. We're trying to get things with our existing customer base and trying to retain those people. And they just didn't have the time to spend on working with a new tool to see if it was going to replace an existing tool. So it was just internal priorities. They couldn't do it. But they said flat out, like, this isn't a no. This is we want to come back to this later. Right. And that could be code for, we just don't want to tell you no, but it, you just don't know. Right. It could be, but I feel like they would have just said no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So do you have plans then to circle back with them in a month or two or what's that look like? Yeah. So probably I, th- I have it on my calendar to go back to them. I forget exactly when the date is, but I, th- I think they said like six months and I think I'll probably give them like four or so and then just touch base with them and see where things are at and start those conversations again. Cause I know it's going to take a little bit of time to get them either up to speed or, you know, allocate some time or what have you. Cause it's, even if I talk to them, they have to have internal conversations first because it's a team of people. It's not just one person making the decision. So yeah, that's that's on my list of things to follow up on. And then the other one, I have to talk to the person who put me in touch with them to see if it was something that they wanted to go forward with or if they were just kind of tabling it for now. But they wanted to use it mainly because their their sales reps were no longer out in the field and needed a better way to communicate. And there's some educational difficulties there. They're, some of them are essentially using MailChimp to send out quote unquote personalized emails to everybody. And I'm like, yeah, that's not really how it should be done. But this is just a different tool. They didn't. I don't think they really get the subtle nuances between them and things with subscriptions and you know people can unsubscribe and then they don't see them and what are they using it for and all that kind of stuff. So that's disappointing to hear. I remember at the end of the last episode, I said, "Well, that would be a big win if you got both of them to sign up." And you said, "It'll be a big win if I get one of them to sign up." <laughs> and I was like, "Come on, Mike, have, have, be more optimistic." But it sounds like that's what happened, you know. And it's a bummer that that they didn't come through. Right. Well, like I said, the uh, the other one, it, it still could come through. I just don't know yet. But it, even if it doesn't, like at least I was, it was being evaluated. And I'm more, I'm more encouraged by the fact that I was in the running for an evaluation with a company that wanted to do a pilot to switch over from an existing tool and use BlueTick instead. So I think that that's a, a very encouraging sign, especially since between that and I've had somebody else who they upgraded their account and added a bunch of mailboxes and, you know, to the tune of five hundred dollars a month as of last week like to me those are encouraging signs do you consider yourself an optimist pessimist or realist oh i don't know it depends on how full that whiskey glass is (laughs) and Mm -hmm. whose whiskey it is yeah i can imagine yeah i don't know there's a lot of factors around it i think i used to be much more of an optimist and now more of a realist then like then life hit me like a freight train (laughs) i wouldn't say i've turned into a pessimist but I also recognize that just because you want something to be true doesn't mean that it's going to be. And there's various challenges or things that are completely outside of your control that factor into it. And some things you can do something about and some things you can't. Let me ask this question in a different way. Would your wife say that you are an optimist or a pessimist? Oh, good question. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I really don't know. I don't think she would say pessimist. Hmm. Yeah, it's not that important. I was just hearing you. I mean, we've known each other a long time and just hearing you talk about the sales and being like, yeah, it's not a no. I'm going to come back to him in four months. Like, you know, it's kind of good to hear your optimism in that scenario. It does seem like you're you're feeling pretty good about things. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, it is. The thing is, like, what I'm in that particular situation, the reason I'm optimistic is because it wasn't a no. But even if it was a no, I would at least be able to have that conversation with them to understand why it was a no and then go do something about it. So to me, it's that's still a learning experience. I can still take something from it and I get something out of it. If they just said, no, we don't want to talk to you ever again. And, you know, by the way, we hired a goon squad to come over and kick your dog. Like, you know, that's a bit of a different situation. And I'd feel bad about it, especially since they can't find my dog because I don't have one. Right. I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm sorry. No, like I, I, I view it as an opportunity to, to learn more and to be able to make things better. Obviously, if there's they hate the color of my eyes, like there's very little I can do about that. But shut off the webcam. Yeah. It's, so it sounds like, you know, I always ask you, like, what, you know, what are the highs and lows over the past seven weeks since we last spoke? And it, would it be accurate to say that the low is probably not closing either of those deals and the high is the $500 a month expansion revenue? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that. And that expansion revenue, because see, that's, I mean, I've been talking about like how recurring revenue is the golden ticket of software sales. Expansion revenue and net negative churn is the golden ticket of SaaS, of recurring revenue. Like if you can build a business that has expansion revenue, it is, it's unbelievable when you see it. When you, hypothetically, if you closed zero new deals, your revenue would grow. Your MRR would grow. It's just, it blows your mind when when you see that happen. So the fact that you had that was just, is this true expansion revenue where their their usage expanded? Like did they add another team? Because it's seat-based, correct? Did they add another group of people after 
using it in production on one team. So it wasn't just a pilot where it's like, well, one person's using it. Oh, we added 10 people. That's our, that's our usage. They actually added a whole nother group. Yes. It's a big deal. Yeah, you should feel good about that. Yeah, and they put one person who is kind of technical on their side and in charge of the the management of the the account inside of Blue Tick, and so that person is managing mailboxes for a bunch of people inside the company. So that basically they're using it for two entirely different things, and they have two accounts in Blue Tick where they can just toggle between the two of them, and you know it's all billed under the same account or same subscription, so to speak. It's just two entirely different groups of people that are using it for entirely different things. So, and it's nice to see that that that's an option for people because I did add that in this past year where it lets them do that because previously you you couldn't do that. It was just you'd have to sign up for a brand new account. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Now, I'm curious. This is something I bring up every time because there, there's a couple concerns I have over the long term. One of them has always been the differentiation. Why are people signing up? Why are people sticking around? And the other has been, you know, how are you going to continue to drive new prospects? Because you had, well, it was over the course of a few months, you had several sales teams or companies approach you and say, hey, we want to sign up. We either want to do a pilot or, you know, we want to sign up and evaluate or whatever. And you're, you're in the sales process. Now, obviously, we've just said that two of them didn't close. The question is, are there any other new ones in the pipeline at this point? Have those bigger prospects, the, we were kind of talking, calling like 500 to dollars a month. Has that pipeline continued or is it mostly dry right now? I would say, yeah, I would say at the moment it's mostly dry. I mean, I do have some leads, but nothing that is concrete that I would say is like, oh, I'm reasonably confident that this is going to come in and we're going to start something. So it's mostly like early leads. I mean, if you look at a, a sales funnel and you say that at the top of it, like they're the 10 to 20% range there, you think they're going to close. And then at the bottom, they're closer to 90. I mean, there's more of them that are at the, uh, the 10 to 20 to 30% range than there are below that. I don't have any that are anything more than I would think 30% able to close in the near future. But that said, like, I think that there's a lot more up at that 10 to 30% range than there have been in the past. And that's a, that's a problem, right? Because if you look ahead a month, two months, three months, there's not going to be, unless you have a bunch of, of smaller customers in your pipeline, which I'm going to presume that isn't happening right now, because I don't think you're doing a bunch of marketing, then you're kind of looking to be flat next time we talk, unless between now and then a larger customer comes and you're able to close them in that seven weeks. Yeah, that's probably accurate. I really just don't know how some how quickly some of these are going to move. There are some things that I'm working on with potential partner where we're essentially doing some sort of a bundled deal with my software. And there are some synergies between the two. And then there's going to be like educational components and basically sort of a done for you service where it's like, hey, here's a, a bundled offering. And with all these things together, this is what you get. And this is what it costs on a monthly basis. And then there's, you know, like an upfront payment from them to do, it's not consulting work, but it's like services work to get them up and running. So almost like a, a paid engagement to get things started and set up for them. And then after that, it's like they're just paying for the software. But there's other things that we've kicked around where the idea is to have like do ongoing work for them. And then we're powering the services through the, through the software. And part of that software is obviously Blue Tick. Yeah, you, you told me a little more about this right before we started recording and more than you can you know say publicly on, on the podcast. I'm pretty bullish about this. It's essentially business development. It's a partnership where your software is included and sold by another company. And it's not with diff- with Hitail and Dotnet Invoice, actually with Drip too. We'd get these emails and it's like, hey, I want to white label your software you know, for realtors. And I'm like, cool, what's your footprint? How many realtors do you have access to? And it's like, oh, we're just starting out. I'm going to build a website tomorrow. And it's like, this is a complete waste of time. You're going to waste my time. But this company is not that. This is a, a company that has reach with a lot of folks in their vertical. And, and it's not realtors. I'll be very, very clear about it. It was just an example I was using. But they have reach. They're legit. They sell a lot of stuff. And your software, you know, Blue Tick being part of that, I think, I think makes a lot of sense if, if that goes through. And you've been spending time on that, right? Like putting that together and, and like getting that kind of moving. Yeah. And I mean, they do have the majority of their customers are teams of people. It's not, they're not selling to individuals or freelancers because their software is kind of useless for those types of people. They do have an option for those types of people if they want to sign up, but that's not really their core audience. Their core audience is um, larger companies that maybe have 10, 20, 50 
hundred different reps working for them that they're going to have licenses for. So Blue Tick does fit in pretty well with that. And I do think that there are opportunities there, and especially since they've got an established customer base. And if we can present that to the existing customer base, not just the new customers that they're bringing in, but existing customers, then that's an opportunity for growth as well. And you know, the relationship is such that I, I do think that there's a high likelihood of some of those things closing. But like I said, if you're talking from a, a sales funnel standpoint, I don't think that they're far enough along to really justify saying that, that it's further along than it actually is. It's it's in that 10 to 30%. Yeah, it's in, in the works, so to speak. Have you spent much time on other marketing approaches? Have you Have you done any of the warm, cold email, just anything else to speak of driving leads right now? I have not. I have been heads down on a couple of things I can't really talk about, at least not right now. I probably could, you know, maybe a couple months out. I'm, I'm not sure. It's always hard to be on a podcast. And yeah. have, I mean, I, and I know what you're talking about, of course, and it's just stuff you can't talk about. So that's, that's where it gets tough. So yeah, you've been spending a pretty significant chunk of your time working on, <laughs> I'm going to say working on something else, but it's like, you're not building another product. So you don't need to hear shiny object syndrome. It's like you're, you're investing your time into something that, that I think you and I both agree could really lead to something for you. Yeah. So I don't know how to really portray that for the listeners other than I've been fairly swamped and haven't had enough time to dedicate to that stuff. But that said, I have started carving some time out of my calendar from like three to five each day to say like, look, this is going to be dedicated time towards marketing so that that way I at least get some of that time in. Whereas before I wasn't putting it on my calendar or making it a priority. Because of that, it was just other things would creep in and, you know, that time would get eaten. And then the next day I'm kind of in the same position. So by allocating a couple of hours a day, I found that that has helped. Yeah. And to be clear, the thing you're investing a lot of time in, it still includes blue tick. It's not like, oh, I'm going to go do this other thing and leave blue tick behind just for the listener. You're not, you're not trying to, you're not just moving from one thing to the next. Again, it sucks that we have to be coy about it, but this is the reality. I said this on episode 500, actually. I was talking about how hard it is, how I wish that every week two people could just sit on a microphone and you could just update you on what we were doing and have it be just amazing radio. But in my experience, and I think your experience doing it for, for 10 years, it's, it's just not always the case. Some weeks, just nothing interesting happens. Other weeks, interesting stuff happens that you can't talk about. This was a really hard thing for me during the drip acquisition process that took 13 months and was for five months was like 30 hours a week for me. And so every week I'd show up and be like, uh, I got to think of something to tell people and, and felt a little inauthentic and awkward. But then it's like, you, you just can't, you know, you can't talk about that. So, so that, that's where that is. And, and we'll circle up and depending on timing on the next one, maybe I will check in with you and be like, hey, is it at a place where we can talk about it? So maybe we go a little further out. You know, maybe we go more than seven weeks in between it if, if it makes sense to where we can talk about that. I'm curious, you know, that this, the whole sealed.net component that you had old customers, existing customers were still using it and you had implemented it with a feature flag such that new customers went on a different component and it was going to be, for, I believe, for the one that was going to do the pilot with you or that did the pilot with you. But is that on hold for now? Like our new customers signing up with a new component, old customers are on old component and, and you're just there and you're not going to migrate right now? Yeah. So all of the uh, new customers as of a while back are using the new version of it. I've not migrated over the existing customers, mainly because that stuff still works fine. And it's a lot of, I'll say data to just kind of migrate for no particularly great reason because the stuff does still work. It's just, it would allow me to do other things. I will get to it eventually, but right now it's not necessarily a primary importance. Doesn't seem like it. Yeah. I mean, if I really needed to some, switch somebody over to the new version, I could do it, but I don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of exactly which things may or may not break or may not come over correctly. So I'm just kind of leaving it as is. And honestly, like as a lot of the things that are not changed are from like customers who've canceled and their data is kind of like scheduled for deletion or whatever. So I'm not too worried about it. I mean, I hate to say like, oh, I'll just let it go until those customers churn out and then just delete their accounts and I won't have to worry about it. But I mean, at some point, you know, in the future that could conceivably happen. I don't think that's a bad approach. I mean, I hopefully they all won't turn out, but when you get down to the point where there's 
a small number and, and you just, you can kind of do it by hand type thing, migrate them over. If there's no impetus, I mean, it is technical debt technically, but as long as it doesn't hamper your feature development, and that's what you said was like that prospect who was going to pay you whatever it was, a thousand bucks a month, there's 1200 bucks a month. Like you were going to do it, do what it took for them. And that's the case where you do it when revenue is coming in. But to me, more of a focus on driving leads, doing sales, that's, that moves the business forward at this point. Yeah. I don't see any major impetus to go back and make changes to those existing accounts because, like I said, they, they work fine. It's just that it, the new storage mechanism allows me to do more. Yeah, I kind of, I think I'm just going to delete this from the, how, like from the future because I, I just, I don't know that it makes sense for me to keep asking you about it because it's, it's at a, you know, while it's technically, it's not done, it's done enough, right? The fact that new customers are using something that you can write tests for and that you're happy with it, that happens all the time <laughs> in SaaS. We still have 30 people on V1 billing and we're on V6 billing like that. That happens and they're using old code. It's not, not the end of the world. As engineers, I know you and I would love we want all the I's dotted, the T's crossed, we want it gold plated and I want everything to be clean. It's not always the reality. And in fact, it's, in my experience, never the reality, especially with a SaaS app that's going quick, that needs new features, that needs sales, that needs all the stuff. You just don't have the luxury sometimes to fix everything. You don't gold plate your code? We can't well, be friends. <laughs> I do, but uh, you know, I tell other people not to, so... You know, it's funny, there's a startup in batch two of Tiny Seed that is growing really quickly and they're, they're scaling up fast. And he, he said, when I wrote the code, it felt like overkill, but now it doesn't. And I said, yeah, it always feels like gold plated code if you kind of prematurely optimize. But if you actually do need to scale, then it feels like you made the right choice. And that's the hard thing to, it's just hard to know. You know, it's hard to know if you're going to have to do that. I felt like with with Drip, Derek and I, like we made the, he he made some like a lot of great engineering decisions, and he wrote really good scalable code. But we just we kept outpacing it, and we would have to every four to six months go back and do this and upgrade the database and stuff. And that was that was taxing on on both of us, I think. But it would have been crazy. It would have felt crazy to do a microsystems architecture from the start with all these different data stores and just when we were launching to 200 people. That would have sounded ridiculous, but if your aspirations really are to get to millions of dollars of revenue, I, I think I would do it differently this time, you know? Just always, it's such a hard judgment call. Well, I, I think that's one of the interesting challenges that most people have as entrepreneurs is like when you're first building something and you don't really have an audience or users or people using the system or stressing it out in ways that you didn't anticipate, you're going to build it one way because you think that the parameters of the problem are a certain thing. And then as you start throwing stuff at it, you realize that those things, you either made some poor assumptions or you were just wrong outright, and then you have to redo them. So you have to do that refactoring process. And then if you were to create a new SaaS app, or if you decided, oh, we're, we're going to go back and we're going to rewrite this, or you move on from one project to another that is a in a similar domain or has similar types of operations, you're going to build it fundamentally differently because you know the challenges that you're going to run into in the future. And most people do not have the experience of building multiple SaaS apps from the ground up. And that's what makes it hard. It's like, if I were to redo things from today, like, oh yeah, there's definitely a lot of decisions I would make very differently. And I'm sure that you and Derek would have made different decisions building Trip, but you don't know those until afterwards. And at that point, it's like, yeah, you just got to deal with whatever technical debt you've built up. Yep. Did you ever read the book, The Mythical Man Month by Fred Brooks? I think I, I think I did, but it was a long time ago. I don't really remember. It was like an early book. It may, may I mean, one of the first books on like software project management. And I think Fred Brooks wrote, yeah, it was published in 1975. They were writing a bunch of uh, like operating systems for mainframes. So old by our comparison and really complex stuff. In The Mythical Man Month, there's this concept. Each chapter is like a like an essay with a concept that he learned and, and that he kind of posits in the book. One of them is called the second system effect. They, the concept is like architects, project managers tend to over-architect and over-embellish and gold plate their second project because you do your first project, a bunch of stuff goes wrong. Stuff doesn't scale. There's bugs. There's this, there's that. So the next one, you want to do everything right and you overdo it. Again, it's his theory that like the third one is where you kind of dial it in between. But I don't know, man, having seen, <laughs> having seen like really harsh scaling issues and being the, one of the people responsible to make that better and to see how long it takes when you do hit scale, I don't know if it'd be, if I'd call it over embellishment. 
Yeah, I don't know. I think it depends a lot on what the the specifics of those issues were, because some scaling issues are easier to contend with than others. And sometimes it just comes down to like messaging and queuing and how up to date certain data has to be in the UI and when you do stuff. And But then there's all this operational stuff. Exactly. Yep. How long can you cache? And that's the thing, man. We did all that. That was the stuff we did for the first several years was like all the caching and all the grouping queries. And we had read replicas of our of the database, but it was it was purely write load on a single data store. You have this Postgres database with 30,000 queries per second running on it. You just hit limits, you know, and, and we had terabytes. I don't remember what Amazon's biggest box was in terms of RAM, but we had eight terabytes of data of, of RAM or whatever, and it still couldn't fit the whole data. You know, it's those types of things where you literally, you're at the extreme of... It's it's no longer, oh, I need to improve this code. It's like, we need an entirely different data store, whether it's a separate Postgres database or more likely an entirely a document database or, you know, something that just has incredible write throughput. But anyways, we're, we're way off track, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an interesting tangent, but I, I, I don't, don't know do we need to keep covering it. I'm curious, kind of as, as we think about wrapping up, there's two things. One is, it sounds to me like, like your motivation is, is healthy and, and you're feeling good. Your sleep is okay, is it? Yeah, it's generally pretty good, which I'm surprised at given the, you know, the pandemic and everything else that's going on and all the additional stress for everything. And my wife's business was holding out pretty well for a little while. And then things kind of started to take its major downturn. Uh, yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Because she runs a fitness studio and, you know, I don't know if folks know, but obviously a brick and mortar and that's is tough. Yep. I forget. I'd have to check with her, but I think that the revenue was down by like 50% as of last I talked to her. Yeah. I mean, it's a subscription business, but people are not, you know, they're like, I want to put my membership on hold. And granted, I get that. She's done a lot of stuff to do virtual classes and she's, she actually rented out her bikes. So she has 20 spin bikes in her studio. And what she did was she, for an additional I think it was like fifty dollars a month. You could, on top of your existing membership, she would give you one of those bikes, and you could take it home. And obviously, it's got to be returned at some point. But while virtual classes are going on, you could use that spin bike to take the virtual class with the instructors that you liked and everything else. So it has offset to some extent the amount of money that she is not making. But there's still a lot of people who've switched over and said, "Yeah, I just pause my membership until this is over." So we live in Massachusetts, and with the new guidelines that are coming out from the governor. Like she, her, as a fitness studio, she's in phase three and that starts presumably in three weeks. Like phase two just started a couple of days ago and three weeks, it'll be like the 28th or so of June. And that's when she's supposed to be able to open up. But right now it's unclear how big her classes will be able to be. So she may have to reduce capacity to like 25%. And, you know, like there's lots of services types, businesses that can't survive on 25% capacity. They just can't. So it's a question of, okay, well, how is that going to go? <laughs> yeah, it's really tough, man, for sure. So obviously that's got to be a source of stress for you. It is. Well, it's more stressful for her than it is for me because I'm trying to not pay attention to it and keep my head down because, I mean, that's completely out of my control. So it's not exactly callous. To, I mean, I guess it is to some extent, but it's like that's her problem to deal with right now. And it's like if I get involved and get stressed out over it, like there's literally nothing I can do anyway. So why work myself up over it? It's like she's kind of got things under control. So I don't know. I mean, I'll help out to, to whatever extent I can, but there's only so much that I can do. And so what are you looking forward to most over the next, well, between now and the next time we talk, let's say we talk in six, seven, eight weeks. What are you excited about? I have some things going on for, at least on the sales side of Blue Tick, which as we mentioned before, like I can't really talk about them yet, but I'm kind of excited to see how those turn out and what comes out of that. It'll just be hopefully interesting. If not, I guess it'll be a good story, but <laughs> I think I think it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. And it could be like additional integrations and stuff like that as well, but We'll see. Very cool, man. As always, I hope you're staying safe. And uh, thanks for joining me on the show again. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me back. And I will be back on Twitter, like, in, what is it, two days or so? Yeah, something like that. Well, I don't, well it's, been, it's been, like, what, a year? Oh, did you, is that, was that your goal, was to take a year off? Yeah. Wow. I'm fascinated to hear how that goes for you. Like, if, if you feel like it, is worth getting back on or if you should just stay off because I don't know, I have some friends who've gone off of it and uh, they don't want to go back, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious, you know, as an experiment, it's just curious to hear. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it once, once you get back in there. 
Yeah, the year off was sort of an experiment anyway, but I really just needed a break from Twitter. I've found it to be fairly refreshing. Although there's there's definitely things that, I mean, I'm not on Facebook very much either. Like I think I've posted once or twice, but only because I was, uh, I won't say required by law, but you know, required by friendly threats. <laughs> it's like, hey, we, we want to hear from you. Um, so I've been a couple of things here and there, but I just I just don't check it. So it's it's nice to have that aspect of it. But there's definitely people that I would say I've kind of lost touch with or don't interact with nearly as much as I used to that I kind of miss that. For sure. There's a social aspect of it. And, and you know, honestly, it was I was bummed that you weren't on when we did the big MicroConf 2020 announcement that, of course, had to be all changed now that COVID was. And, and there's been, I don't know, there's just been milestones that I kind of wanted you to be on Twitter and engaging in. And, and I knew that you weren't on it, you know, so it'll it'll be cool to... Uh, Kind of have you back there to share in that. Give me two days. <laughs> two days. Sounds good, man. I have not gone to look at like my list of notifications either. Like, I am so going to go send you a bunch of uh, DMs and app mentions. I'm just going to probably ignore them, to be honest. Like, I don't, well, you know, I don't if know it's if it's older than really... a week, right? Is it like, yeah. really... or a couple days if it's a tweet, you know? Cool. Well, thanks again, man. All right. Good talking to you. And we'll talk to you next time. Since Mike's going to be back on Twitter soon, if you're not following him, he's at Single Founder on Twitter. And hey, if we're not connected on Twitter, hit me up at Rob Walling. Hope you have a great week ahead. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next Tuesday.